It's been over 50 years ago when Apollo 13 spoke to Mission Control and said, Houston, we have a problem. I submit to you this morning that Harris County in Houston, Texas, faces the biggest problem we've ever faced in our history. If you think that is not true or maybe an overstatement, I'm going to state something else for you. Houston, in all probability, right now is the most dangerous city in America to live in. Whoa. In all probability, Houston is one of the two or three most dangerous cities in the world to live in. Whoa. Those are big statements. Since January of this year through August, eight months, let me give you statistics that I have checked through several sources of where we are in crime. Listen carefully. Auto theft, eight months, 10,166 automobiles. Automobile break-ins, 27,245. Burglary of homes, 4,486. Aggravated assaults, 8,866. Kidnapping, 78. Robbery, 4,597. Sexual assault, 487. Murder, 273. And right now, ladies and gentlemen, the murder rate in Houston, Texas is greater than the city of Chicago and certainly New York, right here where we live. What's the cause of this? A lot of things. Delayed justice. There are over 135,000 untried criminal cases right here. There are over 60,000 pending felony cases. There are over 450 untried capital murder cases. And there's some 54,000 new criminal cases entering the pipeline this year, eight months. There are 182 violent offenders released on bond have murdered someone this year. 182 violent offenders released on bond have already murdered these eight months. One hundred and eighty two people. Turn back the calendar. Turn back the calendar. Repeat offenders back in twenty sixteen out on bond in Harris County, Houston. There were only 33. See the difference? Today, 2021, we have 979 criminals out on bond. You see any difference when you put left-wing progressives in office? And it's a whole scam. Let me tell you how it works. And by the way, ladies and gentlemen, if the most liberal city in America we think is San Francisco, and they had enough votes to recall an absolutely woke DA, what do we need to do? What do we need to do? Let me tell you. Let me show you a little bit how this works, and I've checked this out with many people. 
You have a criminal who is caught. And by the way, our administration does not back up very well our sheriffs and our police who are already on the job. They're afraid to be a policeman because they're not backed up by those they answer to. That's one problem. But how this works, you have someone who is called or tried and they go before a magistrate who is appointed by the judges and the magistrate, let's say it's a big criminal case and sets the bond for $100,000. Generally, bondsmen get about 10% of that, be $1,000. But here is a criminal who cannot come up with $1,000. And so therefore the bondsman says, well, come up with something and owe me the rest while you're free. Let's say he came up with $1,000, he owes $9,000. What does that criminal do in order to remain free for an indefinite period of time? He goes and robs and steals again to get the other 9,000 so he get the bondsman off his case. Corruption, laziness on steroids. And here we go, catch and release. The lack of law enforcement. We have right now, we're looking for already 25,000 suspects and we have only 12 people in the sheriff's office who are looking for all those suspects of crime. Hmm. We have 700 unserved warrants for murder. People that have been warranted for murder and we have 700 of them and the warrants have not been served. Police is short, it's staffed by over 2,000 officers we need. Leaving accused criminals free to roam and commit more and more crime right here in our town, in our county. What happened to all of our resources for law enforcement? They have been diverted to bicycle trails and other green initiatives rather than salaries for hiring desperately needed new officers. Multiple reports of ambushes on those bicycle trails, street people living on them, ride the trails at your own risk. Now, do you think my opening statement was, was under said, ladies and gentlemen, if Houston and Harris County is to survive, we had better throw those bums out of office. They are not doing their job that we have called them to. The federal government has, and uh, so in a sense does the state and the local government has, what is called the balance of powers. The executive, the judicial, the legislative, but there's a fourth balance, and that is we the people. Amen. We the people. <laughs> now we say, well, it's politics. Oh, how I've heard that. How I've heard that. Someone did a little etymology of politics. Say poly means many, and ticks are bugs in the mite family who are looking for hosts to suck the blood out of them. But the true definition of politics is not that, not that at all, not the slime and the filth and the bribery and the payoffs and the undercovery and the lack of doing the basic responsibility we've elected them to do. Oh, that's, that's the slimy part of politics. 
But you know the true de definition of politics? You can see it from Mr. Webster. The total complexity of relationships between people living in society. The pure definition of politics is the relationships of people within a society. And by that standard, I say, that's a pure, high, holy calling. And we have some people in the political realm, let me tell you, are godly men and women. Make no mistake about it. We just have far too few who are willing to sacrifice for the well and the goodness of the people. But this is the true definition. Therefore, we sign off on this, and therefore, listen carefully. Jesus was a great politician with a pure definition because he was in the relationship business, was he not? He established where you and I can have a relationship with God in Jesus Christ. He established we can have a good relationship with ourselves. He established where we can have a relationship with others. So Jesus was a divinely appointed, given politician in the purest sense of the word. But we live in a woke society. Once again, we go to definitions. You go to Google and Google woke, and let me show you the definition they'll give you. Woke, aware of and actively attentive to important facts and issues. Boy. That makes all of us woke, doesn't it? But what is the actual definition of wokeness? Let me see what that is. Authoritarian worldview that seeks to destroy foundations of Christian faith by overpowering, overwhelming, and canceling, cancel, canceling those who do not adhere to their godless ideology. That is the wokey people who are practicing this in our society. Now we're going to be on this subject all the way through November, right here in this place. Let me begin by saying, I'm not going to cover everything today. Surprise, surprise, surprise. And always we have some gainsayers who say, well, pastor, you didn't mention this. You didn't mention that. You left out that. Let me tell you something. We've got a few months here to deal with this and to show how we're going to deal with it in a straightforward way. Next Sunday, we're going to talk about the sexualization of America. Hold on. And the next Sunday, we're going to talk about the critical race theory. Hold on. So relax, I pray you'll be faithful as we grapple with all the wokeness that is absolutely destroying our world and destroying America and destroying our city and is nothing but abject evil. Now, the question somebody's already asked me this morning as I said a little bit of these statistics, they said, you know, we didn't really know, did you? We, did, we, we didn't really get all this. And what has gone wrong with us in our culture? Why has the church been asleep in this critical moment of history? It has happened before. You look at the book of Revelation, you see there in chapter number three, Jesus is writing to the church and he's writing to various churches, seven of them to be exact. And he comes to the church at Sardis and it sounds like the modern church in America today. Look at what he says. I know your deeds and you have the reputation of being alive but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast 
and repent. And if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what time I will come to you. To the church at Sardis, he says to all the churches today, wake up, wake up. The church in history many times did not wake up. And therefore we ask the question, why has the church, the total body of Christ, basically been asleep? What has happened to us? What, what took place? First of all, I would say there's a misunderstanding of church and state. And I've dealt with this many times, but you need to hammer this in your mind. It's an idea that somehow the church could be separated from the state and therefore the church needs to be silent, particularly in the area of politics, when Jesus was the consummate politician that dealt with relationships, but the church had been silent. When there is a vacuum, what happens? Nature abhors a vacuum and something fills in. Look at Korea today. South Korea is the most Christian nation in the world. North Korea, you go there and try to build a church, try to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. It would not be tolerated. Look at nations around the world. Freedom religion is long since gone to the Muslim countries and many Western countries. There's this wall of separation of church and state. In the United States, we see it standing, what has the church done? I thought about the story of the news reporter who went into a bar and he had his mic with him. And a good old boy, redneck, was down there in happy hour, you know, one of these guys who uh, know everything and are street corner philosophers and cowboys and he was drinking a, from a mug over there and the reporter went over there and said, could I ask you a question? He said, oh, she just asked me anything. He took another gulp. And the cameraman was there and put the mic in front of him. He said, what are the two biggest problems in America? And he said, <laughs> took another drag and said, I don't know and I don't care. He said, it's amazing. You got both of them right in the first that question. <laughs> Apathy. Asleep, at ease in Zion would be the biblical terminology for it. We don't understand separating the church and state. Get this, get this once and for all. I've dealt with it many times standing right in this place. The idea that there is a wall between church and state, the way it is interpreted by left-wing progressives is totally inaccurate. You do not find that phrase in the Constitution, the bylaws, or any of our foundational documents. Where did it come from? When Thomas Jefferson was elected president, most of the Christians in the colonies opposed him. They said he was not a Christian, which was right. At best, he was a deist. But all the Baptists voted for him, interesting. All the other Christians' denominations voted against him, but Jefferson was elected. And therefore, after he was elected, a little Baptist association in Danbury, Connecticut, wrote him a letter of congratulations, and they said, Mr. President, we hope you will stop the establishment of religion in all of the colonies. Now, what does that mean? In Connecticut, then, the official religion of the state was the Congregational Church. And many of the colonies had their own particular denomination or abomination in which they encouraged all people and they got preferential treatment from the state government, from the, from the colonies, you got it? And they were writing saying, we hope this will not happen. And Jefferson wrote a letter and said, there is a wall of separation, paraphrase, between the church and the state and the state should never give preference or establish any religion in and of itself. We have freedom of all religions. And you read that First Amendment, it says exactly, we are the religious freedom of religion 
and not freedom from religion as some would have it interpreted in order to silence the church. So understand it is a misunderstanding of the separation of church and state that has kept a lot of the churches from saying, well, we can't deal in politics. Also, there's a misunderstanding of the gospel. In the NRB meeting in Washington, National Religious Broadcasters had a convention, and one of the prominent Bible preaching, teaching individuals on television, I'll not call his name, all of you would know him, prominent, not the health and wealth crowd, no, this person really seeks to teach the Bible. And he said to a group in the NRB convention, he is not going to speak on anything controversial in order to preach the gospel. Now, I was stunned at that. Eric Metaxas was there and told me the story. I was stunned. And I would ask anybody, what in the world do you think the gospel is? First, there is bad news, and then there is good news. The gospel is John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish and will have everlasting life. That's the gospel. But the gospel 3, 17 is the other side of it. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be salvage it might be saved. We receive Christ and then we get involved in the affairs of the world in the name of our Lord and Savior led by his spirit. We have had a misunderstanding of the gospel, a misunderstanding of church and state. Finally, we've had a misunderstanding of Jesus. They say, well, Jesus was just love. He was so nice. He said, suffer little children to come unto me. Unless you have the faith of a child, you'll never get to heaven yourself. Oh, Jesus was totally loved. We see that there, don't we? What about Jesus going into the temple on two occasions and taking all the Pharisees and Sadducees who were exploiting the people, and money changers, con artists, and he turned over those tables and took a whip and drove them. Was he that the same Jesus of love? that you find the Jesus of love, little children? Absolutely, because we misunderstood what biblical Christian love is all about. It's a misunderstanding of Jesus. What did Jesus tell us that we're to do? What are we to be like? What are the metaphors used? We're to be salt. We're to be light. We're to be water. We're to be bread. We're to be leaven. We're to be a key. What, does, what word describes all of those metaphors that Jesus said you and I are to be? The word is penetration. Salt has to penetrate the food to give it taste. Light has to penetrate the darkness to eliminate it. Bread has to penetrate the body to nourish it. Water has to penetrate all of our being in order to keep us alive. A key penetrates a lock. The leaven gets into the bread in order for it to rise up. You see the key word, we are assigned to penetrate and we're to penetrate every area of society. We misunderstood Jesus. So the church has been silent, misunderstood the meaning of separation of church and state. And then we look, we say the church has not understood the gospel and the church has not understood Jesus. And then what happens? We have forgotten the three basic institutions God in Christ established. Three basic institutions. I want you to look at them with me in the book of Colossians, chapter number one. In other words, God said all of the world is to be founded on these three institutions. And look at what the institutions are. 1 Corinthians, chapter number 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. That's referenced back to Genesis, the establishment of the family, Adam and Eve, be fruitful and multiply. And he says, for in him all things were created, 
things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things and in him all things hold together. That is the government. God in Christ created the family, he created government, and finally he created the church. He is the head of the body, the church. He is beginning and the firstborn from among the dead so that in everything he might have supremacy. God has taken his power and he has given it to the family. He's given it, handed it right down to the government and he's handed it to the church. And each one of those have job description in the Bible, how they ought to function. The family is a basic institution of society. God invented marriage, male and female. Leave, cleave, one flesh, no shame. He invented marriage. And then in Deuteronomy chapter six, he gives a formula for it. He talks about, first of all, the 10 commandments in Deuteronomy five, Deuteronomy six, that is the Shema, in which he told the head of the family to meet every day. And when you wake up, when you go to sleep, when they go out the door, you teach your children, you live it and you teach it and that's the job description for the family. And then he gives a job description for the church. And this is where we have mixed up. We have messed up is the role of the church in the 21st century. Now, Norm Mason gave me this term, it's not original. And he says, what is the purpose of the church? You know what it is? Well, you remember the church, what's the purpose of the church? It is to fulfill the Great Commission. And the Great Commission is mentioned by Jesus after he was resurrected from the dead five different times. Look at it. Five times. John 20, 22, Matthew 28, 16 through 20, Acts 1, 1 through 8, Mark 16 through 15 and 18, Luke 24, 44 through 49. You know, when Jesus mentioned five things, something five times, after God had raised him from the dead. Do you think that's important? You know, do you think it has significance? He is saying simply to you and to me, we are to carry out the great commission. Go ye therefore into all the world, make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you right to the end of the world. What's he saying? The first thing he's saying, we are to baptize, we are to win. That's the first part of the gospel. The second thing is we are to teach. And that's the function of the church. And we are to become, get this phrase, get this phrase, great commission citizens. In other words, this is our purpose and we're to penetrate all of society these three institutions he has delegated authority to. The family has a function. The government has a function. Read the government's function in Romans chapter 13. It says clearly, the government has the power of the sword. And by the way, just parenthetically, do you realize if the American citizens would simply and plainly obey what the people in blue tell us to do from C to signing C. Do you realize 99% of all the junk that we have would be done away with? Just obey. You say, well, there's some rotten apples, but there are one in a million who wear the blue and seek to protect us every day. I am 100% for those who enforce the law. So here we are, delegate authority to the family, the father, the mother, what they are to build in their kids, the kind of home it should be. Delegated authority to the government, they're to carry the sword, we are to be obedient, we're to be citizens. And delegated authority to the church, and this is where the church needs to stand up and be counted. Ladies and gentlemen, do you realize that we are so much like Nazi Germany? 
Well, that's so much, so hard to say. When Adolf Hitler took power, he brought together 18,000 leaders of the biblical churches of Germany, 18,000 of them. And he promised them they'd be freedom and independence and they'd be able to worship and do wherever. As a result of that, Neomuller, Martin Neomuller, went out and spoke to Hitler afterwards and said that, look, the role of the church and we cannot support that direction in which you're leading Germany. In that conversation, Hitler responded to him and said, you're a pastor. You take care of the church and I'll take care of the people. That's exactly what we're hearing from all the Wokies that are surrounding our culture. Well, you take care of the church and we in the government take care of the people. Remember the bottom line of all this? One nation under God, we are under the administration today. They want it to be one nation under the state. You take care of the, you do you baptize, you preach, you be nice, you be kind, you help people, you love one another. But my goodness, don't get in the business of the people. Don't get in the political area in the sense that we have defined it. 18,000 pastors were present, 18,000. And 3,000 of them opposed Adolf Hitler. Another 3,000 joined in. And by the way, I would guess that three-fourths of the churches that go by name of church today has already joined into the wokeist agenda. I think I can prove that, about three-fourths. And in, in there in Germany, 3,000 opposed him, 3,000 were for him, and there were 12,000 who said, you know, we're just not going to do anything. We're just going to sit by and play our hymns and do our carols and talk about everybody coming to Jesus. We're not going to get out in that dirty, slimy area of politics, and we've abdicated our role, and we are not becoming, as we must become, great commission citizens because out there we have a chance to give our witness for Christ. That's who we are. That's what we must become. If we do not, ladies and gentlemen, Houston and Harris County is gone, America is gone, and the world is gone. The burden is on those who are in Christ genuinely. I think it was 1935, a German citizen who was a Christian stood up before a group and said that he went to a little church in Germany that was next to a railroad track. And he said every Sunday we'd be in church worshiping, preaching, reading the Bible, singing. And he said we would hear on that railroad track a whistle. And the whistle went louder and louder. And we knew a train was coming, loaded down with Jews, who were being taken to the Holocaust. And he said, they would get closer and closer. We'd hear, ch -ch 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 -ch. and said, when they got right by the church, they would holler, help us. They're going to kill us, save us, do something. And he said, it happened so many Sundays that it was disturbing church and therefore they would turn the organ up louder and they'd stand and sing the hymns more resoundingly. And when they heard the whistle, they would just become so loud in church that they could not hear the screams of the Jews who were being six or seven million executed. And he said, today, as an old man, I have nightmares. And I hear that whistle in my nightmare. I hear that whistle in my nightmare. My brothers and my sisters, ladies and gentlemen, down the road in history, 
if we see the devastation of the Judeo-Christian culture which we've established in the Western world in America, you and I, those who are alive, will hear a whistle and remember perhaps how we did not take the challenge of the hour and stand and engage the godless culture in which we find ourselves. We'll hear that whistle. What's the answer? What, how do you get over a nightmare? You wake up. That's what you do. You wake up. And that's what we must do as members of the family of God.